cannot praise you since you come together not for the better but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. For there must also be factions among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What, do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. For I receive from the Lord that which I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment, and the rest I will set in order when I come. You know, the Apostle Paul had heard upsetting reports of trouble in the church of Corinth on several fronts. This church where Paul had first visited on his second missionary journey in Acts 18 was now embroiled in strife and infected with the spirit of the age and the pagan culture around them. And carnal attitudes had allowed jealousies and petty bickering to stifle any progress the kingdom might have seen there. One of the several problems that Paul addresses in this first epistle was the toxic atmosphere that had settled over their assemblies and was, for one thing, preventing them from rightfully observing the supper of the Lord. They had lost sight of the purpose of their gatherings and what should have been a time for worship and mutual encouragement and edification rather became a gross show of competition and an expose of their worldly hearts. And so here in this text, 1 Corinthians 11, 17 through 33, Paul issues a very strong rebuke and a warning about just how sacred and how serious a matter eating of the Lord's Supper is. You know, I believe the church needs Paul's teaching today, just like Corinth did back then. I think we all understand tonight that communion is a time for looking, it's a time for contemplating, it's a time to gaze upon the cross of one who hung there, no doubt about that, and also beyond question, it is a time for deep introspection of our relationship to Christ and to him crucified, but are the events of Calvary and the personal atonement procured there, is that the sum of the Christian's thoughts and attitude as they partake of this divine feast. Well, as vital as those components of the Lord's Supper are, I believe there is more to be considered as we approach the table. And the Apostle Paul, I believe, details that in this passage. And I also believe that a failure to do this has deprived many of us of the power of the Lord's Supper in our hearts and in our lives, and consequently in the health of many a congregation that comes together to commune. We not only look back upon the cross as we partake, but I believe we look in some other directions as well, and we need to give that some thought. The apostle teaches us that when we gather around the table of the Lord, we look in at least six directions. And I think only then will we more fully understand the significance of how and why the Lord established the supper in the way that he did. I think when we come to view what Paul is fully saying in this passage, we will walk away with a greater appreciation for the simple and beautiful pattern that Jesus set forth when he instituted the Lord's Supper, a pattern that in most cases in the religious world tonight has been set aside. 
and has been changed has been corrupted. I want to begin with what I believe is a very fundamental point. That is that when we gather at the Lord's table, the first direction we look is upward. And we are looking upward in exaltation, or we might say we are looking upward in adoration. We're not only gazing through the eye of faith at the cross of Jesus Christ and thinking about his sacrifice, but we're looking up to the throne of God in obeisance and in worship when we come around the table. I know that because the Lord's Supper is a response to a divine command, and it is therefore to be taken seriously and obeyed in the way that the Lord gave it. We are offering service unto God when we respond to his command to gather together and commune. And it is a command for us to do this. For example, in verses 23 and 20 through 25, we find the little phrase a couple of times, do this or this do. And you know, the Lord has never in any dispensation of time simply left it to man to decide how we would approach him in worship. You can go all the way back to the beginning. You can go all the way back to the time that sin entered into this world, and man had to have a means of approaching the presence of God. God has always specified and stipulated that means of approach. And that was not only true in the Old Testament patriarchal age, and it was not only true certainly in the Mosaical age, it's true in the Christian age as well. Because Paul makes it plain here that there is something that we are to do, and it is not just anything there is something that we are to do. This do. He didn't just say do something. He said do this. Do what? Well, do what I am doing with you now. Do according to what I am instituting in the presence of you disciples on this night. And you're going to perpetually observe this feast in the days to come. And I want you to do it in the manner that I am setting it forth before you right here. Well, that begs the question, what did Jesus do? Do we have to wonder about that? Well, no. The Bible is very clear about what Jesus did. And in fact, you can take the three gospel accounts that speak about the Lord's Supper, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and you can also take Paul's writing here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. You can composite them, and you get a very consistent and a very clear picture of what Jesus did. The first thing Jesus did was he took bread, and that comes from the word artos, which means a loaf. Jesus took a loaf of bread. There was a singularity. He took one loaf, and that was important, and we'll get to that in just a moment. He took that loaf of bread, he blessed it. That doesn't mean he did something magical to it. It simply means he gave thanks for it. And then he broke it, and that means he simply broke a piece off. He partook of it, in other words. And then he gave that loaf to the disciples and told them to eat of it. And so they broke bread together as that loaf passed from hand to hand, and each person broke of that loaf and consumed it. And then the Bible says in the same way, Jesus took a cup. And that word comes from the Greek word paterion, which simply means a container that contained fruit of the vine or grape juice. And notice carefully that what Jesus took, he gave thanks for it, the Bible says. And then he commanded his disciples to all drink out of that which he took and he blessed and he gave to them. In fact, in Mark's account, Mark 14 and verse 23, then he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of or from it. And then Jesus said, this do. They were to perpetuate this ordinance, in other words, like he instituted it. In fact, if you back up to the beginning of the chapter, Paul says in verse 2, I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things, and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. What's a tradition? Well, it's something that's instituted and then passed along or passed down. And this, of course, originated in heaven in the mind of God. It was instituted by Jesus in the presence of his disciples on this night. Paul, who came later as an apostle, learned it by revelation. And now by inspiration, he writes to the Corinthians and reminds them of what Jesus did and how they too were to do it. He said, you are to keep the traditions as I have delivered them to you. That means do it like I've written for you to do it. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. Don't rearrange it. Don't change it. Do it as I have said. And then in verse 23, he tells them, For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you. And I would remind you tonight that it is called the Lord's Supper. We think of this as the Lord's table. It's not my table. It's not your table. It's not somebody else's supper. 
It's the Lord's Supper. And if I were to be a guest and invited into your home to sit at your table, I would sit at that table that you provided and that you set. And we're invited by the grace of God to come and sit at the table of King Jesus from Sunday to Sunday, and it is his supper. And God is reverenced and God is worshiped when his people gather and in humble obedience follow the pattern given by his son. But it's not just merely a ritualistic coming together and doing what Jesus said. There's a purpose behind it because this not only looks upward in exaltation and us carrying out the deed in spirit and in truth, but at the same time, we have a benefit from it in that it looks backward in commemoration. It looks backward in commemoration. Now, you know, a lot of ideas have developed down through the centuries of the millennia about the Lord's Supper. There's been a great deal of controversy about the nature of the Lord's Supper and the form of the Lord's Supper and the purpose of the Lord's Supper. And all of those controversies began to spring up not too long after the period of the apostles. In fact, the idea began to develop not too long after the institution of the first century church, but not at the institution in the succeeding generations. The idea began to, uh, to emerge that the Lord's Supper, instead of just merely being a memorial, was a sacrament. In other words, that the Lord's Supper was a means of bestowing a divine grace upon people. And this further developed into the idea of transubstantiation. And people began to take the idea when Jesus said, this is my body and this is my blood of the New Testament or New Testament of my blood, they began to believe that this meant that when the, the elements of the Lord's Supper are blessed, that mystically they become the flesh and the literal blood of Jesus Christ and that we consume his flesh and we consume his blood when we eat of that loaf and we drink out of that cup. Well, the Bible doesn't teach that. When Jesus said, this is my body, he is simply meaning that this is to represent to you, this is to be to you as you partake, my body. It is a memorial to his body that was given for us. This cup containing fruit of the vine is or is to represent to us the new covenant as ratified by his blood. And I know what Jesus said in John chapter 6 when he said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. But if you go a little farther, not only will you find that Jesus isn't talking anything about the Lord's Supper in that passage, the Lord's Supper hadn't even been instituted when Jesus said that. You go a little farther, and Jesus explains what he's talking about. He's simply speaking of the fact he's using figures of speech to indicate that they were to imbibe him and his teaching. He was the bread of life, his teaching, that would give them eternal life. And it doesn't have anything to do with these elements that we set upon the table directly, but these elements are reminders and they are a memorial to the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I might add, they are a beautiful memorial to the death of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. You know, the older I get, the more interested I get in memorials. And uh, I may be a little morbid, but I like to walk through cemeteries and look at the various monuments and read the various epitaphs. And I like to go to museums. I used to not have any interest whatsoever in going to museums and memorials. But as I say, as the years have gone on, I have developed a keener interest in uh, history and in those places. And, uh, you know, I have been struck by the beauty of many memorials and the thought that went into those memorials the planning, the money, the intricacy that went into those memorials. And when you tour those memorials, it's interesting how even some of the most seemingly subtle nuances of that memorial convey some aspect of thought concerning what is being memorialized. To me, one of the most fitting and beautiful memorials to be found anywhere is right here in your own city to the horrific events of almost 30 years ago. And I toured that a few years ago, and it's so moving. It is, uh, you're, you're, in a sense, um, well, you can't be transported to the horror of that day, but in a sense, you're struck with the gravity of what occurred. And yes, the horror of what occurred. And you're made mindful of all of those who lost their lives and whose lives were impacted and affected that day. And you know, you think of all of the millions and millions of dollars that were spent and the years of careful planning that went into constructing and designing that memorial and 
creating that feeling and that sense as people entered in and began to see these various things that commemorated that awful event. And you can go to New York City and you can go to Ground Zero, I'm told, and be very moved by that memorial. But yet we turn around and we deprive the Lord Jesus Christ of the prerogative to do the very same thing in memorializing his death. Instead, we say, well, it doesn't really matter. It really doesn't make any difference as long as we're remembering Jesus. Friends, if we have the prerogative to design a memorial for something in our lives, Jesus has the prerogative to design the memorial to his own death and his own sacrifice. And that he did. Jesus not only told his disciples how to observe the Lord's Supper, he told them what it means. When he took that loaf of bread, he said, this is my body. It represented his body. Not only his body that was given upon the cross. The Bible uses his, the, the phrase his body in another way to refer to his spiritual body. For example, in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 17, Paul said, For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. That bread represents the body, literal and spiritual body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then that cup containing fruit of the vine, Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Now that's how Paul has it here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And that's how Luke has it in Luke chapter 22. And then if we go over to Matthew and Mark's accounts, it's worded a little bit differently. There, Matthew and Mark say that Jesus, when he took the cup, and he spoke, speaking of the fruit of the vine, said, this is my blood of the new covenant. So the first two gospels, this, referencing the fruit of the vine, is my blood of the new covenant. Luke and Paul say this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Now, is that a discrepancy? Is it two different ways of saying the exact same thing? I don't believe so. You know, whenever we study the contents of the gospels, or the Bible as a whole, for that matter, we have to not only view the immediate context, we have to parallel those passages with other, parallel, with other passages that deal with the same event or the same thing. Uh, there are many events in the Old Testament that you'll not have a full picture of unless you look at First, Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, for example. And you look at the life of Jesus as is uh, told in the Gospel accounts. And you will find these eyewitness accounts and these accounts by inspiration that seem to be different, not contradictory, but they are different. And we have to take them and we lay them alongside one another and we come up with a harmony of the Gospels and a, a composite picture of the things that Jesus said and the things that Jesus did while he was here upon this earth. Well, it's no different when it comes to the Lord's Supper. We don't learn everything that Jesus said and everything that Jesus did in every facet of that night in that upper room by reading one gospel. We compare them. And when we compare them, we get a composite picture of what Jesus said. And what I want you to understand tonight is that Jesus mentions three things when he institutes the supper. He mentions this loaf of bread and he says, this is my body. And then he speaks of the cup, and he says, this is the New Testament. That's not talking about your copy of the Bible, by the way. It's talking about the new covenant, the new agreement that, by the way, is spoken of and recorded in the Scripture. But it's talking about the agreement that we now have with God through Jesus Christ. He said, this cup is the New Testament or new covenant in my blood. And, of course, we understand that Jesus took a cup, not an empty cup, but he took a cup of fruit of the vine. And uh, this uh, grape juice represented his blood that was poured out for us. Now, that presents a beautiful picture. And this is how the early church observed the Lord's Supper. Uh, notice uh, in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 16, Paul not only says the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? He says in 1, uh, 10, uh, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 16, he says the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion, that is the common sharing, of the blood of Christ. Now sometime after AD 70, Ignatius, an elder in Antioch, wrote this, quote, For there is one flesh of the Lord Jesus Christ, and his blood which was shed for us is one. One loaf is also broken to all, and one cup distributed among them all. 
Justin Martyr at the beginning of the second century said, quote, there is then brought to the president of the brethren, and that simply means the person presiding at the service at that time, there is brought to the president of the brethren bread and a cup of wine mixed with water. Irenaeus repeatedly uses the phrases, the bread, the cup, and the cup of his blood. Now again, you say, does it matter? Does any of this matter in the eyes of God? Well, you know, not only have I seen men build many memorials, God has built some memorials down through time. And have you ever noticed how particular God was about those memorials? For example, back in the book of Exodus, we're familiar with the Passover and how that God led his people through Moses out of Egypt and into the wilderness, journeying toward the promised land. And it was by a great act of God that they were freed from the heavy hand of Pharaoh and set free from their bondage, and they were to commemorate that event. Now, that Passover took place because Moses told them they were to take a lamb, and they were to uh, kill that lamb, and that they were to take the blood of that lamb, and they were to spread it over the lintels of the doorpost of their house, and they were to gather inside that house that was marked or covered with that blood. They were to eat a meal together, and, the, and that as God would pass through the land that night, striking dead the firstborn of every household, he would pass over the houses that were marked by the blood. Again, we know that story. But have you ever noticed the detail with which God gave those instructions through Moses? In Exodus chapter 12, they were not only to kill a lamb, eat a meal, they were told when to observe it. The first month on the 14th day, not the 16th day, not the 8th day. They were to do it on the first month of the 14th day. And they perpetually observed the Passover on that day from year to year. God specified the animal. They couldn't just kill any animal. They were to take a lamb. He told them what kind of lamb. It was to be a particular lamb, a lamb without blemish. They were told what time to kill it at twilight. Listen, they were told how many to kill. They were to kill one lamb per house. One lamb per house. Now, what if you had a family or a household too large? What do you do about that? Did the circumstance dictate what was to be done? No, it's the other way around. What was to be done was to dictate the circumstance. Because Moses very specifically told them, if you have too many in that house to eat that one lamb, then some need to go over to another house and eat one lamb with them because there can't be more than one lamb in each house. God was very specific about that. They were told uh, what to do with that lamb. Spread its blood over their houses. Not just anywhere, they were told where to spread it over the lintel and doorpost. They were told how to cook it. They were to roast it, not boil it, not any other means of preparing it. They were told what to eat with it, unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They were even told what to wear when they ate it. They were to wear a belt and sandals and have their staff in hand. Now, much of that was practical due to the events of the Passover that night, but it was also rich in symbolism. And then fast forward some 40 years later after they left Egypt and had wandered in the wilderness, and finally, after all of those years of their faithlessness and doubt and rebellion, uh, a, a remnant was able to enter into the land of Canaan. And you remember that as the priests were going to enter into the land of Canaan, bearing the Ark of the Covenant, God performed another miracle quite similar to what he had done 40 years before. God rolled back or held back the waters of the Jordan to allow those priests to bear the Ark across the Jordan River into the land that God had promised them. Well, God had some memorials in mind, at least two uh, that we read about in Scripture in that event as well. When they crossed through the dry bed of that river, Moses said that they were to, that, that they were to take a stone for each tribe, one stone for each tribe, out of the river. And when they got to the place where they were going to camp on the other side, they were to erect those 12 stones into a monument, into a memorial of their crossing. God didn't just say throw together a heap of stones. God didn't say you all just get together and decide how you want to commemorate this. God said one stone per tribe, and you take and you build a memorial out of those 12 stones. And Joshua chapter 4, verses 1 through 9, tells us exactly what they did. And you know, if it were left up to you and to me tonight, we could form a committee we could raise all kinds of money. We could think of all kinds of ways to memorialize those events. 
for this event here today concerning the Lord's Supper, but God didn't leave it to his people to remember them as they saw fit. He built the memorial. And think in comparison how beautifully simple, how beautifully simple and attainable this simple memorial, this sacred memorial spread before us each Lord's Day is. And there we desecrate it by changing it. And then, not only does it look backward in commemoration, here's where I want to spend a good bit of our time tonight. It looks around in participation. It looks around in participation. This is a primary purpose of the Lord's Supper. And it seems to me as I read this text that this is what the Corinthian church had completely lost sight of, as many have today as well. What was happening here in their assemblies? What, what had Paul so upset about what he had heard was taking place in the church at Corinth? Well, you know, for many years, I believed and even preached. And uh, I know many people believe this, that what had happened was that the Corinthians had basically just turned the Lord's Supper into a common meal. And so instead of coming together with a loaf and a cup, and observing the Lord's Supper in its simplicity, they had just spread this thing out into this big gluttonous feast, and therefore the Lord's Supper had somehow got lost in all of that, and they had perverted it, and so Paul had to rein them in and tell them the pattern and bring them back to the rightful observance of the Lord's Supper. I now believe there is much more involved than just that. In fact, I don't believe that. I don't personally believe that they had changed the Lord's Supper. I don't believe that they were using... I don't think they substituted a loaf and a cup for uh, whatever kind of food they set upon the table and then turned it necessarily into a common meal. I think there was something else going on. What was happening was the church at Corinth was observing, and this is what scholars and commentators refer to as love feasts. Now, they were coming together and eating a meal together. Now, there's nothing wrong with that in and of itself. And Paul did not condemn, by the way, their coming together and eating a common meal. He didn't condemn that because Paul put some conditions upon it. Paul, what Paul tells them in this chapter is, if you can't do that the way, if you can't do it in any other way besides what you're doing it, then leave it at home. He doesn't say you ought to be having a meal to begin with. And you know, today sometimes the church comes together as uh, brethren and friends, and, uh, you know, we spread a meal tomorrow. We'll have some tables spread out over here across the way, and we'll people will bring food, and we'll enjoy that. We'll get our plate, and we'll go down the line, and we'll pile it up probably more than we ought to, and we'll enjoy that together. And that, of course, draws us closer together. So you might think of that as a love feast, but it wasn't exactly what was taking place at Corinth. It wasn't just this big potluck dinner spread down a big, long table and everybody come and get all they wanted. But rather, people were bringing their meals to this feast, and just like you have in any culture, in any society nearabouts, you had people who were rich, and you had people who were poor. You had people that had an abundance of things, and you had people that struggled to get by from day to day. And historians tell us that the city of Corinth was a very vivid example of this. Not only did you have the rich and the poor, you had the rich who had some very ungodly attitudes toward the poor and who lorded on over the poor and who uh, showed off their wealth before the poor and they shamed the poor. And this is what apparently was taking place when the church at Corinth was coming together and having these love feasts. And they were shaming those who did not have as much as those who did. And it evolved into a gluttonous display of pride and arrogance and worldliness. So Paul tells them, this should not be. This should not be. And so he says in verse 20, Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Now, that's the phrase that confused me for a long time. But you know how the American Standard Version renders that? I think it clarifies what Paul is saying. He says, when you come together in one place, it is impossible for you to eat the Lord's Supper. It is impossible for you to eat the Lord's Supper. Well, that paints a little different picture. And can't we see what was perhaps happening here? That here they come together as a group of people, supposedly a body of believers, a congregation that should have been knit together by love and their unity in Christ Jesus, but instead they were anything but unified as a body. There was all kinds of division in the church at Corinth. 
And Paul, I believe, is saying that this atmosphere you have created there when you come together makes it impossible for you to gather around this table and do it in the right frame of mind and in the right spirit. And therefore, when you come around this table, you are not discerning the body of the Lord, and you are eating and drinking damnation to yourself. I want you to notice some of the phrases and words that Paul uses in this context concerning the Lord's Supper. He calls it a communion. The word communion means a sharing. Now, friends, that tells me right off, communion is not an individual thing. You can't have communion by yourself. And I know many people believe that and think that and practice that, but the Bible does not teach that. The word communion is a common sharing. It is a fellowship. Not only that, he uses the word together. In fact, if you'll search the scriptures, you'll find the only time that the Lord's Supper was, uh, was observed that is recorded in scripture is when a congregation of God's people came together as a body. It wasn't a family thing. It was not just a few Christians get off over here by themselves and observe the Lord's Supper. It was when a congregation <laughs> came together. Why? Well, remember what Paul said in chapter 10. He said, for we be many are one body. And that bread represents that body. And so therefore, uh, we come together as a congregation and observe the supper. He uses the term one, one bread, one body, the cup of blessing in one place. He uses the term covenant. The word covenant means an agreement and implies unity within itself. And God, I would remind you, he doesn't have a covenant with you and a covenant with me and a covenant with this one and a covenant with that one. He has a covenant with his church. He has a covenant with his people. And you see, each local congregation is the visible manifestation of that body. This congregation is the body of Christ in this place. This congregation is knit together and functions together and worships together and serves together as a body in this place. The congregation that I'm a member of, we are the body of Christ in that place. And therefore, when we come together and we observe the Lord's Supper together, we are doing so as a body, and we are reminded in some facet of this of the covenant that we have as his body with God through Christ Jesus. Now look again at chapter 10, verses 16 and 17. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread, the loaf which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. Listen to that. We, though many, are one body. Does that sound familiar? Well, flip the page to chapter 12. And Paul spends nearly the entirety of chapter 12 telling us why. You're one body with many members. Uh, you have, just like in your physical body, hands and feet and ears and eyes and a nose and all of these various parts that work together under the coordination of the mind or the central nervous system. And that body functions and it lives. So he says that's the way the church is. It is a body that is made up of many members who are brought together under the headship and function together under the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in chapter 12, verse 13, he says, by one spirit, and I believe that means through the influence of the Holy Spirit, through the preaching of the gospel, we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, listen now, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. That's an interesting phrase. And I read some time ago, James McKnight, the illustrious scholar of many years ago, he contended that this was an, that phrase was an allusion to the Lord's Supper and our drinking out of the cup of the Lord together. Albert Barnes is even clearer in his commentary, and I want to quote this verbatim. He says, quote, this probably refers to their partaking together of the cup in the Lord's Supper. The sense is that by their drinking of that same cup commemorating the death of Christ, they had partaken of the same influences of the Holy Spirit, which descend alike on all who observe that ordinance in a proper manner. They had shown also that they belonged to the same body and were all united together, and that however various might be their graces and endowments, yet they all belong to the same great family. Now, you know, we might quibble here and there with a word or two or the way something is couched or phrased, but I think that in essence is saying what Paul is teaching in this particular verse. And it goes right along with what Paul is teaching in chapters 11 and into chapter 12. 
And the question is, how could they possibly do such in the divided state in which they found themselves? Listen, they were divided over preachers in chapter 1. They were divided over morality. And they were overlooking sin because of the person involved over there in chapter 5. They were going to law against one another, taking one another to court, and suing one another in chapter 6. They were divided over authority. They rejected the authority of Paul. They rejected the authority and headship of the man over the woman in chapter 11. They were divided over spiritual gifts in chapter 12. They were jealous of one another because this one had this gift that some deemed more impressive and spectacular than this more meager gift that this one had over here. And so there was all of this infighting and these carnal attitudes one toward another. The church at Corinth at this time was a mess. It was a mess. So here in chapter 11, that's exhibited by how they were treating one another when they were coming together in this love feast. And Paul is saying, it is therefore impossible when you come together in one place to observe the Lord's Supper. You have created an environment that destroys the very picture and the very purpose of coming together to commune anyway. You know, most of us here tonight believe that here on this table, in the morning should be a loaf of unleavened bread. And as I've already preached, we believe that has great symbolism. And we are very strict about following the pattern exactly as it is. I'm all for that. I believe that as much as anybody in this room tonight. And if someone were to come up here tomorrow and to take that loaf and begin to break it into several pieces, there would be some brethren here who'd raise their hand and they'd say, Whoa, stop. That's not the way we do it. That's not what Jesus did. I'd be one of them. But why don't we get as upset when people with their personal agendas and their petty and carnal attitudes fragment and break up and divide the body of Christ? We come up, we come to this table with a cup containing fruit of the vine. And in a show of unity, that cup passes from hand to hand, and we partake of that cup commemorating the new covenant ratified by the blood of Jesus Christ, and that is wonderful. And most of us tonight would not like it if we changed that. But why do we get as upset when someone comes along with their own agendas and their own pettiness and divides the body of Christ? And I'm going to tell you tonight, there's really no difference. You might as well do one as the other. They both destroy the purpose and the meaning of the Lord's Supper in the picture as Jesus originally painted it. And that leads me to our next point very quickly. It not only looks around in participation, here's Paul's answer to it. It therefore needs to look inward in examination. That's his answer. Look beginning in verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Well, can we see what maybe he's talking about when he says you're coming together eating and drinking in an unworthy manner? He says, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. What does he mean by all of that? Let a man examine himself. Every person is to come to the Lord's table in a state of self-examination. Now, many people believe what that means is we should very carefully inspect our life. As we come to the table and sit there, we should make, think about our life and make sure our life is pure and that we've confessed our sins before we come to this table to God and that we don't have any sin on our account between us and the Lord. So, well, that may be true. I'm not taking away from that. We dare not come to the table of the Lord with unconfessed and unrepented sin within our heart. That makes a mockery out of the Lord's Supper. But I just don't think that's what Paul is saying in this particular passage. I think there's another facet of self-examination he says is to be going on here. When you come together, you Corinthians, divided as you are, you ought to come to that table examining your heart and examining yourself because you'll be coming to that table as the body of Jesus Christ and you are coming to that table as anything but 
Yes, when we come to this table here today or tomorrow, we are to think about and we are to commemorate the mangled body of our Lord upon the cross and his blood poured out for our redemption. Yes, that is absolutely true. But Paul says we're to discern his body. And you notice that he says there, he doesn't say there to discern the body and blood of the Lord. He doesn't say not discerning the body and blood of the Lord. He just says not discerning the Lord's body. And it's striking to me that all throughout his letter to the church at Corinth, he keeps using this metaphor, the body, the body, the body, the body, the body. And when he uses that term, the body, he's referring to that congregation of believers in their divided state, the body. The word discern, it means to make a difference or to distinguish, to set apart. I think what Paul is saying is when you come to this table, You need to come to this table understanding that you're coming to this table as the body of Jesus Christ. And you're partaking of that loaf which represents his body. That one loaf which is to represent his one body and the unity of that body and the love of that body and that which knits that body together made up of many members but yet brought together as one in Christ Jesus. And Paul said, because you are not doing this, you are bringing judgment upon yourself. He said, many are sick and weak among you. And he said, some even sleep. Now, there are two schools of thought about what that could mean. There are those who say that this means that they were spiritually sick because they were neglecting the Lord's Supper. And some had already spiritually died. Well, there are two issues that I have with that. And one of them is this. Whatever Paul is talking about is a judgment for their behavior, not a cause of it. They were already spiritually weak because what they were doing exhibited their spiritual weakness. What he was talking about was a judgment for what was happening. And not only that, sometimes sickness and death are used in Scripture as metaphors for spiritual sickness. There's no doubt about that. But it's interesting to me that the Greek word that Paul uses here for death is a word that always means physical death. And if it's different in this passage, it's the only passage that I'm aware of that it would be. There's another word that's used to refer to spiritual death. Now you say, now wait a minute. You say, why aren't people dropping dead today when they don't discern the body and blood of the Lord when they come to the Lord's table? Well, for the same reason people won't drop dead when they lie today. Like Ananias and Sapphira. You see, sometimes God, especially in the early stages of some revelatory period, sometimes God exhibited his judgment in a visible and a direct and a physical way in order to get a lesson across to his people as a whole in order to set a precedent, and in order to make his people understand the severity of God's judgment for their behavior. And that was the case with Ananias and Sapphira. And I personally believe that people in the church at Corinth were suffering physical sickness and death as a result of what they were doing. And Paul is saying, this was a judgment upon you for doing that. Now, are people dropping dead today? No, not that I can tell. But you know what I believe that ought to tell us when we look back and see what was happening back then and what Paul addresses is that when we come to this table right here, it's serious, serious business. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and there he's talking when he speaks of the body, and he said, you are the temple of God, the temple of the Holy Spirit. In that context, he's talking about the church at Corinth, the congregation. You know, he makes a statement there in that chapter. He says... He says, uh, do you not know that you are the temple of God and the spirit of God dwells in you? And if anyone defiles the temple of God, that is the church, if anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. God will destroy him. You'll meet God's judgment, whether it be physical now or whether it be spiritual, and that's the one we need to be worried about, spiritual in the hereafter. Eating and drinking damnation unto ourselves we have to be careful and you know paul in verse 22 of this chapter chapter 11 when he said do you not have houses to eat and drink in he said or do you despise the church of god that's how they were acting toward the body of christ in this place reminds me of a story i heard i'm almost done but it reminds me of a story that i heard 
about President Garfield. President James Garfield was a restoration preacher, you may be aware. Before he became a uh, president of the United States, he was also a major general in the Civil War on the side of the North. And somewhere in his memoirs, there is the story related that on a particular Sunday, some of the soldiers from the North and the South wanted to worship together. And so they convened a service out there in the field or the woods, wherever they were, and they found their old barn or shelter somewhere, and Brother Garfield preached, and he observed the Lord's Supper with them. They called a ceasefire from the north and the south, and came in and observed the Lord's Supper together. And then he said it was rather strange to him that as soon as they said amen, they all went back out in the yard, and they picked their rifles up, and they immediately started firing at one another again. And isn't that what God's people have been guilty of sometimes from place to place? We come together in a supposed show of unity when we're not unified. And what we do is we make a mockery when we do that out of this beautiful setting on this table, which is a beautiful show of unity. Quickly, it looks outward in proclamation. Jesus said, you eat this bread and drink this cup, and in so doing, we proclaim the Lord's death. It not only renews our hearts as believers, it preaches to the world as Christians come together and observe it. I walk nearly every day. I walk five or six miles, and when I'm home, there is a park in a home that's a beautiful little park. It's about a three-mile trail that winds down through the woods, and it has a place where it comes up into this clearing, and there are ball fields and a big sports complex, and I do that just about every day when I'm home. For some time, they were building this thing over across the way, over their parking lot. They were erecting some sort of a granite structure. And I didn't pay much attention to it. I didn't know what it was until a couple of winters ago. I never saw anybody pay attention to it. A couple of winters ago, it was a cold, dreary, overcast winter day. And I came up out of the woods. I was nearly alone in the park. I came up out of the woods. And I just glanced over that way, and a vehicle had driven up, and a young lady had gotten out, and she had walked over, and she was standing in front of this thing. She was obviously very sad. Her head was bowed, and I watched her. She stood there for a few moments with her hands folded, and then she got in her vehicle, and she slowly drove away. What a piqued my interest. And so I made my way over there. When I got close, it was a beautiful monument, made of granite, polished granite. And it had the form of an angel with its wings spread out on top. And on the front, it said, Angel of Hope. And I walked around to the back side, and it said, Our children loved, missed, and remembered. And then I looked down at the base. It was then that I started to see the little photographs, and the flowers, and the teddy bears, and the notes. And I was greatly moved that day. I've never been through that. Maybe some of you have. I don't know what my life would be like if I lost one of my children. She apparently did. And that day as I stood her standing, I saw her standing there, I thought, that poor woman, she was standing there thinking back whatever day it was when all the stars went out in her sky. And that was a sacred place to her. And when God's people with great emphasis and great priority and great consistency come to this place Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, it is a testament to this community of the importance of the death of Jesus Christ. Something that means very little to people outside these walls in many cases. We should be showing them how important and sacred it is to us and should be. You know, we've gone through a very difficult, confusing few years. A few years ago, when it seemed like the world was coming unraveled, we didn't hardly know how to get our bearings and what to do. Some brethren did this and some brethren did that, and I'm not interested in passing through all that and worrying about that tonight in this sermon. I'm just, I'm not. What's past is past. I'm going to say this. Most of our brethren 
try as quickly as they could to get away to come together. They might have met the barn, they might have met in somebody's shop building or somebody's office building, or in a home, but they're tracking it together and commune. That's wonderful. But I want to say this. If we did that to thumb our nose at the government, if we did that to tell the president or the governor or the mayor, you can't tell us what to do, we were wrong. What I hope the world saw in that was a group of people so dedicated to the cross of Jesus Christ and his memory, and that is such an integral part of our heart and our life that we couldn't go a week without doing what Jesus asked us to do. And then finally, it looks forward in anticipation. He says, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We don't come together merely to remember a crucified Lord, but to celebrate a risen Savior and to anticipate his coming again. I'm told that the Jews in their uh, modern day cedar meal, the time of Passover, that they have a tradition that in one way is a beautiful tradition, in other ways, it's very sad to me. I'm told that at the end of the table in their house, they leave an empty seat. And they sit there at that empty seat, an empty cup. And they call that Elijah's seat and Elijah's cup. And what it symbolizes is that they believe one of these Passovers, one of these years, Elijah is finally going to appear after 4,000 years and is going to announce that the Messiah has come. Well, you know, from a symbolic standpoint, that sounds lovely and quaint and beautiful. But it's also very misguided because Elijah came 2,000 years ago. And he announced the coming of the Messiah. And the Messiah came 2,000 years ago. And we celebrate a Lord and a Passover lamb who was sacrificed 2,000 years ago and who rose again. But you know, in a sense, when we come together at this table, there's a remembrance that one day we do look for our Messiah to come the second time to take us to eternity, to live with him forever. And every Sunday, when God's people and congregations around this globe gather in beautiful auditoriums or in some humble little room in the brush arbors of Africa or Asia and spread before them this simple, elegant, and beautiful picture of a loaf of bread and a cup of fruit of the vine and they share in those sacred symbols. They not only look up and honor and worship God, they not only look back to the horrid but precious scenes of Calvary, they not only look around at the body of which they're a vital part, they not only stop and look inside and inspect their spirit and find the humility that Christ showed us to have. They not only look to the world around them and proclaim that Christ has come and shed his blood for their sins. They look forward in eager anticipation that maybe that will be the week the trumpet will sound and he'll break through the blue and call his waiting bride to be forever with him. The lesson church tonight. Is there one here that's not so gospel? Or that is subject to the gospel? You've never obeyed the gospel. Well, I want to say this as kindly as I possibly can. And I don't say it to be exclusive. I say it to urge you to become a member of the Lord's body. Because if you're not part of the Lord's body, you don't have a seat at this table. This is for those who've been redeemed by Christ's blood. This is for those who are in that covenant relationship. That's who this is for. But the wonderful thing is that God, by His grace, has extended to you personally an invitation to come. Because you've got to come and be redeemed. Be washed in the blood of Jesus. Be added to that body. And if you've never been baptized for the remission of your sins, it might be a great time for you to do that. Be added to the body of Christ. Your child of God, they can all they should be with you. Why don't you come back? Get back in beauty. Get back in fellowship with God's people. The body of Christ. Be part of that body. We bid you do so long, Sarah.